All right, if you've noticed, there's a big race on to reduce the frame rate of the transmitter to the quad. But is the lowest frame rate really that important when it's not very consistent? So today we're gonna to talk about frame rate consistency, how important it is, and we're also gonna show frame rate consistencies between DJI, Ghost, Tracer, Crossfire, and Express LRS. So what do I mean by frame rate consistency? Well, when you move your sticks here on the radio and you make a nice clean movement, that's not actually how the signal is sent from the transmitter to the receiver and then onto the flight controller. It actually is set in steps, which I'll show you here in a second. So it's almost like you're moving your finger in these steps and then moving your finger back in steps. And then obviously that's all the four different controls that you have there. Now the frames are pretty fast. They're measured in milliseconds. And you know, older transmitters had frame rates of around 30 milliseconds. Now they're getting down to as low as four milliseconds on the frame rates. But the consistency of that frame rate is key. If it's jumping all around from four milliseconds up to 30 milliseconds, well, that's gonna give you an inconsistent feel. And when people are talking about how they can feel the latency between DJI, Fat Shark, so on and so forth, we're in that realm where it is possibly something that you can feel or an inconsistency you can notice on your sticks. That all has to do with transmitter frame rates from the transmitter to the receiver into the quad. And there's other negative ramifications as well. So in this log here, you can see the difference in frame rate consistency. This is an R9 unit from a while ago, the ACCST version, not the new Access R9 units. And you can see that the frames really jump around, these steps, this is the roll command, and you can see right here we're measuring 102 degrees per second is the commanded roll rate. You can see we have a 33 second frame, then it goes down to a six millisecond frame, 13, 20 milliseconds. So it's just jumping all around in, in the spectrum of that frame rate that, you know, it's kind of stepping those commands up until we get to the full rotational speed, which is a thousand degrees per second with my rates, and then back down. Now, if you don't smooth out the frames when they're coming in, you can see this is the stepped commands here. You will get all kinds of motor oscillations and vibrations. So this is the spike commands to the motor. So it's basically telling the motors to ramp up, ramp down, ramp up, ramp down. And you're gonna get that consistently. If your frame rate is varying, so here it's a pretty consistent frame rate on this specific log, that jumping around, that oscillation is gonna be even worse. It essentially means down here at the bottom where it's kind of ramps down, it will lag longer where it won't be pushing a motor command anymore and then all of a sudden the quad will get really behind because you are doing a consistent hand move to the right or to the left so that it's going to make the quad even lag even more so you got the frame rate could possibly up to 20 or 30 milliseconds your quad lags in a normal standard pit controller by about 20 to 30 milliseconds as well when you're doing a sharp move. So you can see by not giving a ramped up motor signal consistently to the motors, it's very difficult for the motors to keep up with the quad so that delay can give even longer. I liken it to if you're receiving directions by somebody sitting in the passenger seat of the car. If they're very consistent with you and say, hey, we're gonna go up here and make a left, it's no big deal, it's smooth, it's simple. But if they're very inconsistent with what they want you to do, saying, yeah, make a left, don't make a left, yep, yep, I'm not sure, but yep, make a left, you're probably gonna just miss the turn altogether. And that's kind of the same thing. We want consistent signals throughout the entire process to the motors or the, the stuff gets just left behind and you might just miss movements altogether because you don't have a consistent signal getting to the motors to tell the quad what to do. Now in Betaflight, we smooth out the RC step signals so you don't get these oscillations like this. This is actually a KISS log. However, even with a reasonable amount of smoothing, you're still gonna get some steps in there depending if that frame is a long enough gap. So if it goes from like six milliseconds up to a 30 millisecond frame, that's a pretty long time where it's just staying even. So even with a reasonable amount of filtering, it's not gonna smooth that out. Sure, if you apply a ton of filtering, yeah, that may be able to smooth that out, but that has delay all built into itself as well. So just like always, filtering is good in moderation, but you don't wanna just dump it on to solve all kinds of other issues. So here with the smoothed out RC signal, you can see we have a packet jumping up and we're going from six millisecond frames up to like a 30 millisecond frame. And that is occurring every 200 milliseconds or 0.2 seconds. As you can see, it's getting smoothed out here, this bench. But even with that bench, you can see the motor inconsistency, the kind of, it's pushing the motors to ramp up to get to the full rate of rotation. And then it, they just, it, the command just dies down to nothing. And then it goes ahead and ramps back up again. So this is a little spreadsheet I've been compiling over the year years, unfortunately, of uh, frame rate inconsistencies 
uh, with a bunch of different protocols. You can kind of see them over here on the right. And one more thing before we dig into this. It's important not to confuse frame weight with end-to-end -end latency. So the simplest way to think about end-to-end -end latency is if I go ahead and flip a switch. That switch is gonna send an instantaneous signal from the transmitter to the receiver into the flight controller. That latency between when I flip the switch and when it actually the flight controller detected it, that's end-to-end -end latency. Frame rate is a different thing. Frame rate has to deal with when I'm making an analog movement, that your hands are analog, and I'm making an analog movement, that has to get digitalized and has to be put into packets. Those packets are the frames, and the rate at which how long those packets are, that's the frame rate. So you can have two millisecond packets, four millisecond packets, 30 millisecond packets. It really is just making those stair steps. So they're two different things. The frames are being transmitted through the same thing that the switch was. So you still have the end-to-end -end latency and then how often those packets are being updated and sent. So they somewhat add together your end-to-end -end latency in addition to your frame rate. It really depends on the timing of when the frames are coming in. So it's not exactly adding them both together, but hopefully you can understand the difference between end-to-end -end latency and frame rate. They're two different things. So this is where we used to be. This is the FR Sky X SRM, and you can see the frames are jumping anywhere from nine milliseconds. Sometimes they were really low. They were down to, you know, down here was two millisecond frames, but all the way up to 30 millisecond frames. So that's a very inconsistent. And this data right here on the flight, some people say, well, that could just be drop frames. We're only looking at 50,000 samples and at eight kilohertz, that's only six seconds. So this quad is very close to wherever anybody's taking it off. I collected this information from a, a bunch of different people. I don't have all these transmitters and receivers. So all the data we're gonna be looking at here is all the first six seconds of a flight. So you can see how many frames and how it's jumping all over the place. Now, of course, if you're not moving the sticks a lot, then it doesn't really matter. But if you are moving the sticks a lot, you know, in a racing condition or in freestyle, trying to avoid things, then it does matter. But back to this, we can take a look at the RXSR. This is in D16 mode, eight channels. And you can see here again, nine, and we're jumping almost almost all the way up. And here's one at 30 milliseconds. Uh, a little bit better here though. This was, you know, most of them were only going up to 18 milliseconds. So a little bit better there. Now this one right here, this is the new FR Sky access protocol. I'm not exactly sure if this is the 2.4 gigahertz or if this is their R9 module. I believe it's the R9 module, I hope it is. But you can see the frame rate is very consistent there. So there was a bunch of people that brought this to FR Sky's attention, and I'm very glad that they addressed it. But I really wish they would have addressed it for everybody that already had their equipment, the ACCST versions, and not just say, hey, you can buy a whole new radio and a whole new module, and then, then we fixed it. I'm not buying a whole new radio and transmitter and everything because you fixed something that you should have fixed for everybody on their existing equipment. So anyways, let's look at DJI and you can see DJI, it's kind of all over the place, but it isn't honestly as bad as I think. I almost think that since it's all over the place, the average of what Betaflight detects and sets the filters is somewhat higher. So it's up around the you know, five or six millisecond uh, area there. Uh, the frames do jump up. They are in the, you know, 10 to 11 millisecond frame, but you can see it's more just a wider band and the frames are very inconsistent in there. After looking at a ton of logs with this, I would say it's better to have a thicker band that's, you know, kind of a narrower range, you know, from here to down to here versus have a real thin band that then all of a sudden has these big spikes that go up anywhere above 20 milliseconds. You can really see that's where it drops those motor spikes and those motor commands. So really it's important to keep that down narrow as possible. If it's oscillating a lot, but it's only going up three or four or five milliseconds, that's not too bad. But where it has these really big taller jumps, that's really where you can see it affecting the motors if you happen to be in a sharp move or sluicing back and forth in a racing condition or something of that nature. So this is the Tango 2, and you can see it is pretty consistent here. This spot right here, this is where it's actually jumping up to 50 hertz range. So it's going from 150 hertz mode to 50 hertz mode, which actually goes up to 20 milliseconds. And what will happen in that scenario is Betaflight will train on that. But another important factor with Crossfire is to recognize this is the first six seconds of the flight. So it's not that far away and it started to jump up already. So typically in a racing condition, when you're a little bit farther out on the track, not even that far, like 
200 feet, it will start to jump up to the 20 hertz mode. So you could have a little bit of inconsistency right there where that's occurring. While of course your frame rate jumped up on you there as well, but then also the filters take a little bit of time to kind of retrain on there. And then when it jumps back down. So there's a little bit of inconsistency you could have in, in that when it's jumping up and down. Now keep in mind with the latest versions of Crossfire, you can lock it at 150 Hertz mode. Which in a racing condition, I would definitely recommend that you do that. This here is the R9 ACC ST version. So this is the one I noticed and it, these are exactly 200 milliseconds apart. And you can see it's going from six milliseconds and then it's going up to the 14 and it really does have an impact. So even, you know, it wasn't even getting up to the 20 milliseconds, but these bigger jumps like I was talking about before, you can definitely see them if you're happen to be in a move. Fly Sky, very consistent, no big jumps. They're up at 20 millisecond frames. However, they're consistent, so you're not gonna have any inconsistency in there uh, with full telemetry and so on and so forth. So to some extent, I'd rather have larger frames that are completely consistent versus inconsistent frames and trying to push that down as far as it can for you know, having the faster frames. It, it, I think it's good to have faster frames, but only if you can do it consistently. All right, so let's get into the big boys, the modules. This is Ghost in a Duo setup. So here you can see they are having pushing down, you know, your frames are down here four and a half milliseconds. However, you do get some jumps up to about nine milliseconds. So again, this is only six seconds of flight, so this is not that far away. A lot of times things are jumping up for telemetry packets and things of that nature, but you can see not everybody has to do it. So FR Sky with their access, you know, still has telemetry and it's not jumping all over the place. Next we can see Tracer here as well. So that has, you know, even lower four millisecond frames, but now we're jumping up to 12 milliseconds. So mostly it's just doubling again, typically for telemetry, but that's not, the telemetry here would be more of a consistent thing. So I don't know why it's doing it in between here. And then again, we're also jumping up by three frames in some scenarios. So two frames would be, you know, it's missing two frames here to get up to eight and then it's actually missing three frames to get up here to 12. So I don't know what's causing it, but you can see the data again, the first six seconds of flight. Now this was a really bad crossfire unit uh, outside of crossfire shot. So this was kind of before that. And you can see this was jumping all over the place. Um, so yeah, it just, that was not good. Here are two really short tests that uh, Joshua Bardwell actually did. He was taking a look just on his bench between eight channel and 12 channels on his crossfire. And you can actually see, and this is you know only a couple seconds, he was again just on his bench moving the sticks a little bit. And this is an eight channel or in 12 channel mode, you can see it jumping up here. This is outside a crossfire shot. And then here in eight channel mode, it actually was jumping up. I wouldn't say any less or more. I would say they're about the same. I guess in 12 channel, it almost looked like it was jumping up less. Yeah, kind of looks like 12 channel was kind of jumping up a little bit less than eight. Hmm. Now on to Express LRS. So the best of the best for Express LRS, which I haven't got my equipment set up just yet, but it is 4.2 gigahertz, uh, 250 hertz, which they're working to go up to 500 hertz. And then this is with telemetry off though. So that is the thing with Express LRS to get these really good consistent frames. And you do have a couple jumping up here that you have to have telemetry off. I believe that's consistent with the 2.4 gigahertz uh, value. And the guys can you know drop a comment down below if that's incorrect and I'll, I'll pin it. But uh, again, this is one of the best ones here. Again, 2.4 gigahertz telemetry. I believe this is with telemetry off. 250 hertz, we're getting down to four millisecond frames, and yet there are some uh, jump ups here, but you can see just meshing it off with everything else, it's, it's not too bad. This again is Express LRS. Uh, now this is the R9 module, so we're at 200 hertz, so we're at five millisecond frames, 400,000 baud rate, and I believe this does have the resistor mod added to it as well. Again, telemetry off, you can see very consistent frames along the bottom. We did have some jump ups right here, but the rest of it, you know, really just mm -hmm. five milliseconds the whole time. Now with that said, I do have my R9 unit with Express LRS on it, and I have that at the 400,000 baud rate, telemetry off 200 Hertz, and you can see I am getting some packet jump ups here. But with mine, this is, this is the test results I got. I'm hopeful that after I put on the resistor mod that I'll hopefully get the same thing. Now with Express LRS, there is a setting for your telemetry and it's the packet ratio. So you can set that to 
1 to 128 is the high, it's either off, which is no telemetry, or 1 to 128. Literally meaning if the packets are five millisecond frames, you take five times 128, that means every 640 milliseconds, you're gonna get, it's gonna double the packet. So you're gonna see if we go from five to 10, these are every 640 milliseconds in duration. So just taking a look at the 2.4 gigahertz contenders as of right now, I would say your two winners so far are the Express LRS and like it or not, FR Sky Access. The difference between the two is, you know, Express LRS has a kind of a tighter, they're really holding a very tight, consistent frame down at the bottom where they're, when they're on target, they do jump up every now and then. You can see a couple of the spikes through here and they're 2.4. Um, but that is presumably with no telemetry. I'm going to make an assumption as well that the FR Sky Access has full telemetry and their frame rate is higher. Seems like it's around seven milliseconds, bouncing around seven milliseconds, but there's no jump ups at all in there. So it's looking pretty tight. There's a little bit more bandwidth at that area. So it might be jumping up and down between 6.6 milliseconds and 7.2 milliseconds. But again, those little fluctuations up and down don't really matter too much. It's the, the larger spikes. Tracer's not looking so hot. Uh, Ghost Duo's looking a little bit better. Uh, Tracer does have a little bit of an edge out in you know baseline frame rate, but again, I don't think that's nearly as important as consistency. Now keep in mind with this as well, that there's only two out of these that are actually doing 2.4 gigahertz on the LoRa chipset, which is a heck of a lot more sensitive. So you're gonna get a lot more range, almost like crossfire type of range. So, and that is gonna be Ghost Duo and Express LRS. The other two, which are Tracer, and FR Sky Access are not doing that on the LoRa chipset. Now in the 900 megahertz arena, it looks like we have the Tango 2 uh, with Express LRS as being the two top contenders. The Tango 2 or, or Crossfire with Crossfire Shot, you know, as full telemetry, you can lock it to either 150 hertz mode or 50 hertz mode if you're going out longer range and want completely consistent when you're at so much shorter range yet. Although the R9 ACCST on its native firmware does have full telemetry, you can see it has that frame rating consistency and it's pretty sizable. You can of course choose to put that on Express LRS where you get a lower base frame rate. So if you want telemetry, you, mine works great on one to 128, but mileage will vary. Sometimes if people put it up that high, they'll get telemetry lost signals from the radio. Again, I don't have that issue on mine. There you do get some jumps from four milliseconds up to eight millisecond frames, but it's three times as long between those jumps. So it's, you know, 640 milliseconds in between instead of 200 milliseconds. Telemetry is though not full telemetry. So there is a, a trade-off there. Now, I don't have an R9 access radio or module, and I don't have any data on that. But from what I understand, the R9 units that are not ACCST, but are the new protocol, the access protocol are very consistent as well. And of course that's also full telemetry. So there again, like it or not, FR Sky is doing a pretty good job with their brand new protocol. All right, well that is it. Hopefully that helped understand frame rate consistency with here with moving the sticks. And also when you hear the brand new latest greatest hype on the lowest latency you know, transmission signal or frame rate signal from the radio to the transmitter, you can ask that secondary deeper question is, it's great that it's low latency, but how is the consistency on the frames? Thanks everybody. I do hope this helped. If you enjoy this content, please do make sure to hit subscribe, drop a comment down below, hit a like, and if you're feeling generous, check out the Patreon and I'll see you on the next one. And like smash that like button, please. Cause, then I, if if you guys get me a billion likes, then I can make videos that are Fortnite. So, do you want Fortnite videos or this video? What's better?